Hello, everyone. Hope you're enjoying day two of ATX TV from the couch. Um, so much programming we've already had and so much more to come. One of our favorite things is when we get to bring people from our favorite shows together to talk about their craft of writing television. And although this year is no different, the world is obviously quite different. So this panel really came to be as we knew writers' rooms were getting back together. And how do people do that? Writers are used to being in a room together talking and figuring things out. So how does that translate to this virtual world that we are obviously all now living in? Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ben Travers. Ben, you ready to come on out? Hello. Hello, welcome. I'm gonna let you take it over and enter the panelist, but it's nice to see you. You too, thank you, Emily. Uh, first and foremost, welcome everybody to ATX TV from the couch. Uh, I am Ben Travers, IndieWire's TV deputy editor and critic. Uh, sitting on the one couch that I have in the one room that has good light, uh, ready to talk to some great writers who've made uh, the time to speak with us today about their uh, new normal, as we tend to be calling it. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to uh, point out that at the bottom of this page, there is a button that says donate. And um, if you want to try to do your part and support some great causes, ATX is raising money for direct relief in the Actors Fund. Um, given this is season nine of the ATX Television Festival, uh, it'd be great if you could donate $9 uh, or multiples of nine. $27 is great. $90 is great if you can spare it. $900 if you're really, really feeling generous. But please check out that button. Um, and now we will move on to the panelists. First and foremost, uh, I want to welcome uh, a writer on Supernatural, The Magicians, Aquarius. And now she's show running the Netflix drama, You, Please welcome Sarah Gamble. Hi, Sarah. Hello. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Of course. Uh, next up, we've got the Emmy-winning writer of The Daily Show and Late Night with Conan O'Brien, as well as Parks and Recreation. And now he's working on, I believe, I mean, what, the 10th, 12th, 15th season of Brooklyn Nine-Nine. It's Dan Gore. Hello. Uh, it's the, uh, we're working on the eighth season. Eighth season. I mean, it feels like it's been with us forever, and I'm very excited to dig in. I hope you mean that in a good way. Of course, of course. Uh, moving right along, uh, we also have a writer who you may have known from Lost, The Vampire Diaries, Falling Skies, uh, and now she's working on the CW's Nancy Drew series, uh, Melinda Shoe Taylor. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Melinda. Thanks for being here. Uh, and last but certainly not least, uh, she's been a writer on DC's Legends of Tomorrow, Arrow, and now she's adapting the DC comic Sweet Tooth for Warner Brothers Television. Uh, this is Beth Schwartz. Hi. <laughs> These reveals are so dramatic. <laughs> and we've got the reveals. We've got so many people. We've got to try to build it up as we can. And it's very exciting to see everybody. So thank you again for making the time. Um, to kind of get things started, I, I know it feels like, at least for me, that we've been doing Zoom calls for as long as I can imagine. And um, mm -hmm. believe it or not, that wasn't always the case. So what I wanted to ask about first and foremost was just what was it like when you first had to make the transition, when you first realized that you had to move the writer's room from kind of the physical space that has been the mainstay for so long, for decades and decades, to a virtual space? Uh, and what were some of the early challenges facing that? And uh, Melinda, I'd, I'd love to start with you. Um, I vividly remember the moment we made the decision because we were in the middle of talking to David's staff at CBS. We were shutting down in... Um, you know, day six of eight of filming 120. And we ended up using 118 as the season finale. And while I was talking to the president of the network or the studio, I was like, well, so I'm assuming you don't want us to continue the writer's room because we had agreed to bank two scripts. He's like, no, 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 continue and be on Zoom. So like that was in the back of my head while I was also saying to the writers on a conference call. So we will continue on Zoom as planned March 18th, but I gotta go because it's crew lunch and they're making me an announcement in 15 minutes. I gotta text the cast, bye. You know, so it was all like a big jumble of the shutdown, which all happened very quickly. Um, but then once we started, I mean, by the time we knew that it was happening and the quarantine was happening at the same time, I actually had done a Zoom birthday party for my son, like the, um, around the same time, like just as the quarantine was starting. So I was kind of like, oh, this is an interesting new world. And, and also, I was so happy to see the writers' faces, even this big, you know, <laughs> that we were all like, there you are, it's magical. 
So it became really um, useful right away. I realized that I was actually a little more focused because I had to look right into everybody's eyes all the time <laughs> and, and that there was less getting up for snacks. There were fewer bathroom breaks. I mean, people, of course, can go whenever they want, but I think you feel like, okay, we're just going to sit here for two hours. Let's just really bear down on it. So it was weird. I don't know. The biggest word that I come up with is weird. No, yeah, I feel I feel like that's probably a very common emotion. But um, Dan, what about you with with Brooklyn Nine Nine? Uh, what was kind of the that transition period like? Well, we so we started this year on Zoom. Um, so, so we are now five weeks in, and we're you know doing the blue skying and the story breaking. So it wasn't this year a transition from from a physical space to Zoom, but obviously it's a transition sort of historically and. You know, there were a lot of things we did as a group in the physical space that were really fun and felt integral to the process. I'm sure my wife thought they were integral to me being really late all the time, but like we had a very elaborate lunch picking system that involved a wheel of fortune wheel with restaurants names written on them and then a veto system where you could pay a dollar to veto the restaurant and spin again, $2 to veto the veto and the pots got up to the hundreds of dollars and then we'd have drawings for them. So we've lost all of that. And instead, we, uh, we meet virtually like this. And, we, and it's, it is more efficient, but it's weird. And it is, it's less fun, I would say. There's less joking around. I mean, that, that first week, there were certainly a lot of, I think we did every possible Zoom joke you could do and <laughs> changed our background to every possible version of a background, including everyone else's background. I got a set of watercolors for my mom. I watercolored my background. I had that behind me. Um, we did videos of ourselves behind ourselves. <laughs> I guess we found new ways to waste time is the point. Well, that feels like one of the most important aspects of, of kind of making the transition in the sense that you have to familiarize yourself with Zoom. You have to familiarize yourself with the virtual reality of it all. And uh, Sarah, I guess for you, when, when you were going through the same process, were there similar challenges that you had to kind of wrap your head around? Were there aspects of it that you were like, man, I, I don't know if this is going to work out? Um, I think right when we went home, there was a, almost a little bit of relief because we were following the news so closely. We were, we were social distancing in two separate rooms for weeks before we went home. Um, we, wow. we sort of split the room in half just so people could have six to 10 feet between them to work. And a couple of days before we finally went home, I asked the writer's assistant to just keep track of how frequently the word coronavirus was said in the writer's room. And at one point it was every two minutes. <laughs> so I was like, well, go home. At least we'll be able to work. Um, Cause we were, you know, six weeks or so into the new season. And um, it, I, I agree with everything people are saying. We're really relieved that we can keep the room going. I mean, it was really important to everybody to be able to work if we possibly could, but there's a lot about being in a writer's room. That's just the chemistry of people hanging out. And there's a lot, I think in, when you're running a writer's room, that's about little things you can do with people in a room that keep morale up. And it's been a learning curve for me to try to figure out how to translate that to a virtual world where I'm just staring at these little faces and trying not to read too much into what their faces are doing at any given time. It's just a completely different way of, of speaking to each other. Can I also just say another thing is, I, I think there's like, it's nice to be able to feel a reaction to like a pitch and it's much harder to do that over Zoom. So I, I find that I'm talking myself into and out of story ideas because I'll be like, what about this? We could do blah, 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 blah. And then I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's, I find that to be really difficult. Sorry. I'm I think that the comedy version of that, it's like, it must be really hard to be pitching things like, is this funny guys? And there's a, a corollary for us on you, which is, is this the good kind of crazy or is it too crazy? If he, you know, kills somebody this way and not being able to feel the energy in the room yeah. that way, it, you know, we've, I think we've adjusted and the scripts are coming in and they're really good in my opinion. But um, right. man, I think it's been a stretch for the writers to get there. Well, I mean, uh, Beth, especially for you, considering the fact that you're you're building something brand new, like you don't have seasons and seasons of Sweet Tooth to look back on and, and kind of yeah. be like, okay, we figured out the tone and we figured out the structure, we figured out the pacing and all the rest of it. Has it been an additional challenge because of Zoom? Like, is that something that you faced early on when, when you had to, you know, start making things virtual? 
we start on Zoom. And of course, like I'm sure everyone else, we thought it would be temporary. Um, but then obviously it's been, it's lasting a lot longer than we thought. Um, but I think because we started just to get back to question, I think because we started in a room um, and we had that great um, time together, where we talked about what the show is, what the season we had already pitched to the studio and Netflix, you know, what our season one looked like and what the series was. So I think we had that advantage. And so once we got into the Zoom room, we had other challenge, other challenges, but that wasn't it because we were already um, in the middle of breaking episode four out of seven. So we were, we were okay. Um, did anybody develop like a specific kind of system so that you could, you know, communicate as efficiently as you needed to? Because again, like I've been in so many meetings where even with three or four people, it can be really hard to, you know, avoid talking over each other or you don't want to step on somebody. So then you just stay quiet or somebody's not muted and there's tech things. Was there like a, do you have like a hand raising system? Do you go like in order? Like what are the kind of, I mean, what have you had to do to make sure that you can have the conversations you need to have? There's something very democratizing about these squares and the fact that everyone's square is always equally present and equally sized, which I think has meant that for new people, it's much easier for whoever's running a room to say, oh, and also, you know, April, what do you have to say about this? Uh, so I, there have been some positive trade-offs, I think. We're a pretty big room this year, so I would agree. We frequently split into two rooms as well. When you have a bunch of people, sometimes we'd have nine people in a room. That's just too many to expect a free flow of conversation in all the little boxes. I was talking to a friend of mine who's running another show right now, and he said um, he made a rule that people had to interrupt each other because he wanted to try to recreate conversation as it existed in the room. And, and that can be really, really fast paced. But I was like, you know, you is kind of a show about toxic masculinity. Like the writers don't interrupt each other. That's kind of, <laughs> you know, we feel really bad when we do that because of patriarchy, so we just don't. So instead, we divide into to smaller rooms so people feel like they can speak more. Um, and, you know, the thing that that's done for me, I don't even necessarily think it's a bad thing, it's just different. Um, when you walk into a room on a day and you have an episode on a board, you have an idea of the steps that you're going to take to break the episode. It's like a series of story problems that you're going to solve that are going to start to open the doors to the next problem. And you can let somebody's, you know, chat about their kid going to prom lead you to that. You don't have to have a really strong lesson plan necessarily, but when you're dividing into separate rooms and you're asking your upper level writers to run mini rooms on zoom, um, it helps a lot to give them specific stuff to break down. So that has forced me to, ask myself more specifically, like, what, what question are we answering today? What are the next three problems we have to solve? Um, and I mean, it's probably on some level making me a better writer and a better showrunner. I have to admit, I think we all kind of sound like downers talking about Zoom rooms. And there are days when it's really, really fun. But I, 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 it's also like, it's taken a little of the romance and spontaneity out of it because I send people off with very specific questions to answer usually, and then pop into the room three hours later to see where we are. You know, like Sarah was saying, talking about one story, you know, that you're talking to your coworker at lunch can lead to, to solving a problem, you know, in the script. So those are the kind of things that, yeah. that you miss. And, and it's, it's just, it takes, it, it takes the fun out. Yes. But it also takes, the creative process and it, and it makes it more challenging and less, um, you know, it, it's slower. I know it's slower for us at least. Yeah. yeah. I, I would say a thing I do that I'm sure my writers absolutely hate is I'll go from one room and I'll be like, okay, think about that. And then I'll go to the other room and then I'll pitch what we just talked about in the other room. And I'm like, what do you guys think? <laughs> yeah, that sounds like, I'm always like, I do it to every room equally. So I'm not like selling out a room, but I like to hear, <laughs> I like to hear the idea again, and I like to hear, because there's so many in a writer's room, there are so many forking paths. That sounds like a good place, but there are so many forking <laughs> paths that end up getting you to a place. And it's nice to talk to people who don't have that history, because the history can be like, you all of a sudden are in this incredibly constructed story that feels so constructed, not to be redundant, and somebody can go, Oh wait, why why are they on a van? Why are like why a van? And you're like, oh right. Six versions ago, mm -hmm. we called the episode 
van time and they started on a van and they're still on a van. I guess that could be anything, you know? <laughs> so for some reason on Zoom, I find it slightly harder to jump between rooms, even though it should be easier, but I kind of like the physical aspect of leaving one, this sounds so corny, but like one thought space and like entering another and, and physically moving. I guess I could like, set up my phone as one Zoom in one room of my house and a laptop in another room <laughs> go back and forth or something. I'm gonna do that, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> the thought process is not just about the words that come out on the board at the end, it's like everything else around it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's also the it's also the intimacy, like there there's something in a writer's room where like you can't quite, you know, people share really personal stories. And I feel like in in Zoom, it's like you kind of can't, get to that place because you know it's impersonal like you're not you're talking to screen you're not talking to that person so I feel like it's harder to get to those deeper places sometimes where naturally like in a room you would share some of those things when you're you know physically in the same space. Sarah you touched on this a little (laughs) bit um uh, uh, a little bit earlier but um the idea that that you know, you're excited about the scripts you're producing and that you're glad mm-hmm. to be working and, and the, you know, you want to, you, you think that the, the quality is good and, and you're focused on that. But like, how, how hard is it to kind of, um, I guess, just make sure your brain is in the right place? Like with that, like with everything else going on, with the new way of working, with, um, you know, with, with, the, with the different things that are happening around the house and the different environment that you're in. Um, mm-hmm. Is there like an extra focus that you have to give to like each script? Like, do you take a script and be like, okay, we got this one done. I need to look at last year's and make sure we're kind of in the same vein here. Or is it just that instinct that you have, you know, you've built up over a career? I mean, I kind of feel like, you know, for every aspiring television writer who is at home right now, because it's a pandemic and they're trying to write while they do a bunch of other stuff and they're trying to modulate the amount of panic inducing information that they allow in. Um, congratulations, you're in showrunner training, you know? <laughs> like when there's not a pandemic, we're in a less acute version of this feeling much of the time. And I don't want to in any way um, downplay the severity of the situation right now. I have never lived through anything like this. And um, you know, shocking things are happening daily in, in a way that's really, uh, um, hard for everyone to process and hits, you know, many people in the room that I'm in very personally. Um, but the idea that essentially what you have to do is focus on the very next problem is the job of a showrunner, because there's always going to be 25 things on fire every day. There's always going to be not one, but six scripts that need your attention. And so that discipline, it's like, I I'm learning it on a whole new level now. I mean, I'm not saying I, I, I went home and then I was just ready to go that day. And I was like the model of efficiency and everyone should learn how to be productive for me. Cause it has not gone like that for me, but the baseline of it is something that I've learned over the years because I have frequently had to sit down and rewrite a script during something that felt like a really severe crisis um, at the time. And sometimes actually was a severe crisis. So uh, it kind of feels like that times 10. Um, And I guess the, the only thing I would say about it is that I feel like it's a new, I have to reset my expectation every morning. I get up in the morning. I try to wait a minute before I check my phone. I check in with my loved ones first and then um, take the problems of the day as they come. And in the writer's room, part of that discipline for us right now is that we're in a place where California is slowly opening. There's a lot we still really don't know about production. Um, The first shows that go back to production will probably do so in the next couple of months. And we're not in that very first wave. We hope to be in production before the end of the year. And um, there's a lot of problems I just can't solve, no matter how hard I try right now, because we just don't have enough information. And again, the way that you face that is with discipline. You just say, don't try to solve problems you can't solve yet. Deal with the stuff you can actually do for the next hour. (laughs) Yeah, we actually, um, we start every writer session with a meditation, believe it or not. I know that sounds very like, you know, LA, but we do it. I have a a sort of podcast um, meditation series that I've got on my phone. And so when we're ready, we, you know, spend a few minutes kind of like, how was your weekend? You know, what happened with the dog or whatever? And so then when we're ready, 
and everybody's present, I say, okay, let's meditate. And there's a three minute meditation called breathing space. And there's this very soothing woman. <laughs> she, she says, you know, kind of like becoming aware of your body and kind of like, you know, settling into having your mind and body in the same place for just a few minutes. And then just focusing on your breathing and then slowly becoming aware of other things around you and then coming back. You know, it's just kind of like, it gives us a three minute thing. And I know some people are checking their email because I hear the clicking, but <laughs> most people I think really like the discipline of that, where it's kind of like, okay, now I'm doing this other thing. I'm telling both my mind and the body to be in this space for the next two and a half hours. Will you, send, will you send me that? That sounds like Yeah. <laughs> One of our writers does yeah. breath work and yeah. especially for the first few weeks when everyone, you know, was even less accustomed to what was going on in the world. Um, frequently when we came back from lunch, she would lead us in a little. So that doesn't sound strange to me at all because it really, it's really helped our writer's room a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's so she, good. Would do, she would do the breath work with the writer's room. Yeah. She would just lead us through a short instruction about breathing really i'm not a breathwork expert but i really like breathing when she tells us how to do it it helps it calms me right down well, that's great we well i mean to to go along with that idea like now that now that you know so much of this is over zoom and there's so much going on um do you guys take on the kind of responsibility of making sure that your writers are in a good space like are you trying to be more like are there things you have to do to be more mindful of you know okay this person has this going on and this person has this going on and, and we want to make sure that there's you know time for everybody to be together but also time to you know go do your thing like go be with your family or go deal with you know your your kid if you have to uh you know um homeschool them or anything like that like are there are there things that are shifting in terms of the time commitment that goes along with all of this First of all, thank you for texting the link. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he is a pro. <laughs> He's using Zoom. That's how it goes. We all take three minutes and come back. And then... <laughs> um, we, I mean, I think you're more mindful or try to be of people in answer to your question, of people's circumstances, et cetera. We, I, I had a writer who has a, we have a writer who has a toddler and he, in the beginning of the year, called me and said, we're at home schooling that, this kid and I might, there might be times where I have to turn off my video and I was like, you're fired. No, <laughs> Obviously I was like, yeah, do whatever you have to do. Um, you know, this is just a dumb TV show, take care of your family. And the, but the hours for us, you know, comedy hours are often pretty bad uh, and they're so much better. I mean, we are doing, you know, 10 a.m., we have like an executive meeting at 10 a.m. where all the upper level writers meet for 15 minutes to talk about what's going to go on in each room. Then we meet from 10, 15 to 12, 30. We have a lunch from 12, 30 to 1, 30. And for the first four weeks, we were really working 1, 30 to 3, 30 or 4. Now it's gone up to 5, 30 or so. And these are, I mean, we would routinely, for the first few seasons of Brooklyn, we would eat dinner there. We'd be there until 8 o'clock all the time and before a table read until 10 or 11 o'clock. So that's a long way of saying, I think we're, that's partly because it's impossible to look at Zoom for that long. And it's partly so that people can be with their families and be healthy and, and experience life. And also production, production being down, that just reminded me of, you know, that was, you know, which is terrible, but for the writer's room, it allowed, usually when production, you know, depending on what show you are, if, you, if production's going on the same time as you're trying to get scripts out, like you're, especially the showrunner, you're being pulled in a million different places. And now with production down, like that is one of the positives in terms of the writers room. you can really focus on the scripts instead of being all over the place. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, I think it's hard when somebody's going through something um, personally, you know, people have encountered life issues um, during the pandemic and, you know, you wanna give them a hug and um, that's tough, you can't. I think that one of the moments that I really so appreciated our particular writing staff as uh, you know, a writer had a family medical issue come up for somebody in her family and, and she was kind of telling us about it in a very candid way and it was really heartbreaking. And every, you could see all 16 people react at the same time. Like everybody wanted to give her a hug, which was very touching, except we couldn't, you know? So that was hard. Kind of to, to to steer things a little bit back toward the content of the writing and, and kind of how things are shifting in, in production. Um, you know, obviously we're, 
it, it seems like Hollywood is still trying to figure out exactly how production is going to resume. And there's been a lot of people talking about the different ways in which production could resume or the different kind of precautions that are going to have to be taken so that production can resume safely. Um, how much do you guys have to worry about that? Like how much is that, you know, something in the back, back of your head, like this could change episodes. This could change, you know, scenes that I've written and uh, dynamics and the way we like, not just the way we shoot, but the way that the story unfolds. I think about it constantly. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's already changed scripts at going, like as soon as it started happening, um, we've already, you know, as we started writing new scripts, when I, when we're breaking it, I'm like, oh, we can't have this, you know, being on a train with like a hundred extras, like, no, let's make that into cargo <laughs> instead of people. So it's, you know, those are the kind of things that you have to think about. People can't be making, I don't know how you works because people make out on your show all the time. So that must be very challenging. <laughs> well, we had to have that conversation. I had that conversation with Greg Berlanti, who co-created the show, um, about how, I guess what you do is you look your partners in the eye and you say, um, you know, we will change what we have to change. First of all, we're not going to do things that actively put people in danger. Television shows are not, you know, it's like when there's a baseline of safety, then we will have these other conversations. Um, but that they, you know, we will change what we can and we will all keep an eye on that sort of line we don't want to cross in terms of what is this show? What is the production value of the show that we feel we've given the audience for a couple of seasons now? And um, we're not going to do the show and have it be shitty because there was a pandemic that season. We're going to be measured about it and figure out a way to retain the spirit of the show. But scene by scene by scene, there's always a conversation about that, about, I mean, even, um, uh, you know, sim simpler conversations about how, oh, this is a scene we might shoot earlier in the season because it is less problematic. We might kick a few cans down the road, see where we are, you know, towards the end of the season to more, to, to sometimes conversations of like, well, we, we don't, we don't know how we're going to do this. You know, Joe Goldberg has a baby in season three. Um, spoiler alert. Whoa. Uh, he has a baby. Oh, he's very, God. very, very <laughs> at the end of season two. Oh my God. I feel like we can let Yes. Whoa. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mind a baby oh. exists on the show. I don't know. We I have the same problem. Pitch you, we you know, I couldn't problem. pitch you how we're going to solve that. Um, no. We, uh, you know, we are living through a global pandemic, and we don't want to put babies in undue danger. <laughs> you know, we're, we're going to figure it out. So you have yeah. babies too. We have uh, our Jake and Amy had a baby at the end of the season, and you know, people want to see it, so. They're going to see a big rubber baby. No, I don't know what we do, but it's obviously a lot harder to have a baby. We're looking into animatronics. Um, There's going to be a run on those those bespoke fake babies that look so it great. So okay. bad. We had yeah, a bespoke a baby on. once, and it was still like <laughs> was horrifying. It's hard, and it's like we wanted to do, and we are trying to do stories about the work life balance for these people, mm -hmm. and. You know, people care about them and their baby in theory. So I mean, it's really hard. And I mean, it's like it, it goes in so many different directions. It's like, and we don't know what's going to happen. So it's hard to write for it. Is it going to be safer to shoot outside? You know, like originally we were thinking everything should be a bottle episode and we should shoot on, this, on the stages as much as possible. Everything will be controlled. But in fact, would it make more sense to like shoot exterior because it seems like it's, just healthier and safer to be outside for people. So we're trying to balance and trying to stay current and that's difficult. Um, yeah. How many extras do you have? Can you have kids? All, all the shows are gonna go up or many shows will go up. I agree there'll be waves of production, but all you know, a lot of shows will start shooting, a lot of pilots will shoot at the same time, movies will start up. So availabilities for guest cast mm -hmm. are gonna be much harder. So it's mm -hmm. like, when you're considering whether or not you want to have an arc with a guest star for five episodes, maybe, or three episodes, you have to think, well, am I going to be able to get a guest star or the guest star that I want for that much time when everything is going to be shooting? Right. Or, you know, right now, Canada has a 14 day quarantine for anyone coming in from the U.S. So it is a great time to be a Canadian actor. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, Nancy Drew, fortunately, 
we have this timeline in the show where we're going to do a direct pickup and it's still October 2019. And in season two, we'll only get to like November 2019. And we've now thought it through and we're going to have, you know, if we're so lucky as to get further seasons, she'll be in like, you know, the winter holidays for season three and maybe season four gets us into February. And then there will be a time jump if we are so lucky as to get a season five and she'll come back from college is kind of, you know, the idea on the table. We will never have people in masks on Nancy Drew just because we have that liberty to plan around it. We are very lucky and we shoot in New Zealand. So we are really looking at production sooner. Mm -hmm. um, and because they have an amazing leader that led their country through this in the smartest way. Um, and so, you know, we're fortunate because right now, obviously it's very safe there. However, we're gonna, there's gonna be restrictions and just like, you know, um, what, you said like the 14, we're, there's a 14 day quarantine. So we are casting a lot of New Zealand locals. <laughs> so it's a good time to be a New Zealand actor as well. Lucky enough to have a few uh, actually watching our Zoom right now. Um, so I'm gonna go with uh, Ariel McAlpin. Are you there? Are you able to pop in and, and ask a question? I am, hello. Hi. Hi guys. Um, I'm also uh, the script coordinator for The Flash. So. I also had experience with the transition from being in the room to Zoom. And it was, like you all said, very strange. Um, so, but it was also very cool to be in the room and see everyone, how everyone worked. And I think one of the things that I learned and that we all took away was like having a, something that's a feel good, um, similar to like the meditation. So I was curious if you guys uh, discovered like a feel good movie or show or book that you maybe like a throwback or something that is new, but whatever you guys found. You mean as a room or just individually what we've Individually, found? like if, um, for example, I, I watched a whole bunch of 90s movies, uh, just went through point <laughs> break. Um, all of the Con Air, all of the, they're not, I mean, some of them are feel good, but whatever floats your boat. <laughs> I found Normal People, which was the best thing in the world, that show. <laughs> and I just went through it so fast. I don't know if anyone's watched it, but it is amazing. And it just it takes you back to like young love. And even though it is has very depressing moments at time, it's still, it's just like takes you out of what is happening right now. Mm -hmm. I, I read a book, believe it or not. <laughs> what? <laughs> Stunning, I know. I haven't done it in quite a while. How many years? In the industry. Usually I don't have time to. And um, suddenly we were, you know, we hadn't quite started the room yet and we were shut down in production and I had this moment where I was like, I'm just gonna read that book that somebody gave me for my birthday. It's a fantastic book. It's called Ask Again, Comma, Yes. And it's about this kind of dysfunctional family or a couple of families. Long story short, it's a wonderfully written book, very moving, very real, and very about emotions and you know, kind of authentic things that happen when you're growing up with a, an alcoholic and a, anyway, it's a great book. And I realized that that was a, a kind of escape that I hadn't given myself in a really long time. Um, that, and I also got Disney plus and watched Black Panther and Dr. Strange back to back. <laughs> good picks, very good picks. We've been watching Top Chef all, uh, LA All-Stars. It's been great. Um, I think I've exhausted the entire BA Test Kitchen YouTube library that's what I watch to get to sleep. And now I've moved into um, this guy named Brad, who's a hairstylist, who watches people fuck up their hair on the internet and comments on it. That's the video. <laughs> I'm kind of just <laughs> like that lame person who never really got on the YouTube bandwagon and then a pandemic hit and then that's what I do. I watch the most, um, you know, I watch people tell me about their favorite donut on YouTube. And uh, for that for that span of time, the world is really simple and lovely. Awesome. All right, well, thank you so much, Ariel. I really appreciate the question. We're gonna try to squeeze in one more. Um, this is Casey Gates and he and Ariel are both ATX pitch finalists. So uh, they've got some, some great experience coming up at the fest and hopefully uh, a little bit more to come in the future. Uh, Casey, are you there? I'm here. Surprise, I'm a girl, actually. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> no, about that. Kidding. That's <laughs> fine. Um, thanks so much for all of your insight. It's been really um, interesting to hear about. And I've been following the conversation online, too, with some other writers, and they're 
uh, feelings about Zoom rooms. And I have noticed some people kind of rooting for that to maybe be a little more of the norm just because of advantages like you've all talked about, um, efficiency, location, maybe not having to live in a major city in the future, which a lot of people are thinking about right now. Um, I've heard it coming from um, the disability community as well, that that could be uh, better access for them. And so I'm just kind of curious if there's any version that you might imagine being a hybrid. Like, do you think that there could be in person with some people that might be zooming in or would that just like totally throw it off and the zoomers would feel left out? Or I just wonder if anyone had thought of that or is doing a version of that of some kind. There's a writer named Matt Hubbard, who's a very, very funny writer. And he was, he teleconferenced, he lived in LA and he was on 30 Rock for many seasons, which whose writer's room was in New York. So I think that that kind of thing has worked, I mean, pre-pandemic has worked and is possible. I think for a show like Brooklyn, a comedy like Brooklyn, there's a lot to be gained from being in the room. Um, and also being on set, when we shoot, if you wrote an episode, you're on set. So the dream of not living in the same city seems, I think, difficult. It, I, it seems slightly more difficult. But I mean, I could imagine in pre-production saying like, hey, let's do Zoom Fridays. We'll do five hours on Friday. Everybody can go somewhere. You can you can like take the weekend off. You can be with your family. Um, I could see incorporating it in that way. Or if there's like, if a person had a family emergency, right. that, you know, didn't qualify as an, but they could still work, but they needed to be at home or whatever. I could imagine, yes, it would be very easy to put a camera in, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but that's interesting. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to monopolize. What it was no, I think it was in a room like that. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, it's a great option. I think what, gets to you psychologically is knowing that there's no other option right now. Yeah. <laughs> I would agree with that. We were on Aquarius, one of our writers lived in New York and he was a giant face on a TV screen for much of the season in the room. And that was fine. We, you know, we had been in a room with him before and it worked great. Uh, he was good friends with the showrunner as well. So we didn't think too much about it. I do think that um, we have crossed a psychological barrier. Like I agree, I would, I would prefer the shitty commute and to be in a room with people most of the time. Yes. Um, I do think that, that there's a reason that we've been doing that and it's not just to spend the studio's money on all that rent. I think it's because mm -hmm. it's good for the creative process and it's good for production. But I think it will be easier to say we should just meet on Zoom on this particular day. And when you talk about the disabled community, I'm actually excited to think that that sort of line has been crossed in so many showrunners heads because we've tried it and it can work. And that, so, you know, when, it, if an agent were to call and pitch me somebody and, and explain why this writer um, would rarely or never be able to be in a room or on set, it's like, well, I know that a version of that works now. Um, and so if that leads to a crop of great writers trying to break into the business who sort of thought it wasn't an option for them before, that excites me. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Oh, um, I agree with the. <laughs> I agree with what <laughs> everyone's saying. I sort of said everything, but yeah, if it if it leads to inclusion in terms of, you know, giving people opportunities who didn't have those opportunities, um, I agree. I think it's we we've, we've done it. I think a hybrid um, would be the. I'm not just saying that because that's what actually Sweet Tooth is about, about hybrids. Um, but a <laughs> <laughs> little plug. Uh, <laughs> but um, I do think a hybrid is the perfect kind of answer to that because um, I do think we've now all seen like, you know, it's possible to work remotely, to have some people work remotely um, because it, you know, it is very stressful um, before this all happened, just working in television, like I was saying about missing work, like, you know, I never would miss work for anything. And so we're now remembering, you know, like your family's what's important, people are what it, what's important and the work will get done and we'll, we'll figure it out. And, and we should really respect, you know, everyone's life and, and their, and, you know, instead of just being so cutthroat about, you know, it used to be just very, a lot, you know, a lot more stress in, in terms of, um, you know, getting to work and putting everything second. Um, so I think this is, 
you know, the, the, the silver lining of some of the pandemic is, is making you realize like what is actually truly important and that is your family and that is people. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for your question, Casey. And uh, thank you so much to everybody for sticking around and, and talking us through this and uh, helping familiarize people with what's going on and, and how they can get a little bit better at Zoom themselves. Um, if, uh, if anybody wants to donate, remember that button is right there at the bottom of this video. Uh, thanks again to everybody for joining us and please check out the rest of ATX TV from the couch. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks guys.